All right. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for coming today. My name is Anna Lawrence, and I'm the president of the B&T Club here at Tepper. I think I've probably met most of you all in the room. Um, but for those of you I haven't met, thanks for being here. Um, I'm honored today to be one of the club hosts uh, for the very first Mellon Speaker Series of the Year, along with Max, who's representing the OLC Club. Um, and we are honored to be announcing Dave Cotelier, who is a 1997 MSIA alum. Um, so this, he is celebrating his 20th year for, out of Tepper, or what is now Tepper. Um, and Dave has a very illustrious career, which he's going to share a lot with you about with you today. Um, however, before he gets started, I just want to give you a little preview. Um, so Dave is the Vice President and Chief Information Officer of Harley Davidson. He's been with Harley since he left Tepper, actually, with a brief stint somewhere else, um, which I think he's going to cover a little bit more today. Um, and as vice president and CIO, Dave is responsible for providing the strategic direction and management of information services for Harley Davidson, as well as all of its business units and subsidiaries worldwide. Um, and Dave let us know that they are actually in 77 countries worldwide um, with about 6,000 employees. So this is no small task. Um, he brings significant strengths to this role, including strong relationships and credibility with stakeholders, a deep understanding of Harley-Davidson's business strategy and culture, and broad experience in process design and performance improvements. Since joining Harley in 1998, Davis delivered results through effective development and execution of strategies in alignment with company goals. He has held leadership positions in operations, supply chain, sales, and product development, and has a well-established track record of strong leadership and capabilities. Prior to being named CIO in 2011, he served, he served as Senior Director, International Strategic Pro Projects, responsible for leading the development of Harley-Davidson Street 500 and 750 motorcycle platform, along with other key market entry initiatives. Prior to that, Dave was serving as the Vice President of Procurement, for contract manufacturing and logistics for the Sarah Lee Corporation. In this role, Dave was responsible for supplier development and procurement of food and be beverage products sold under various national brands for Sarah Lee. In addition, he has held senior leadership positions at Action Pact Inc. Dave serves as chairman for the board of Heritage Christian Schools Inc. in New Berlin, and he also holds a Bachelor of Science in Finance from Northern Illinois University, in addition to his MSIA from Carnegie Mellon. Uh, so with that, please join me in welcoming Dave. I think we all have a lot of fun to learn from him. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. It's always great talking in front of a crowd that's doing this. So thank you for uh, having me here. I'm, I'm extremely honored to, uh, to be here, although there was a slight cold chill that went up my spine when I walked into the room uh, after... 20 years, uh, it still feels the same. So uh, thank you for, for inviting me to, to be here today. Um, actually, I, I think this opportunity came up, uh, we were at the reunion uh, a few months ago, which when you get out, you gotta make sure you come back for your reunion, because it, it it's an absolute riot to see where, where your classmates wind up and just a uh, great opportunity to reconnect and see what's going on. So a little plug for John and the Alumni Association, but, uh, but reunions are great. But at the reunion event, I actually had a conversation with uh, Lori Weingart and um, actually led, I think, to this, to this opportunity. And uh, when, just a, a short story, when, uh, when the email came uh, from Dean Damon to invite me to come and speak, I got really excited, and I and I said to my assistant, um, "Look, my my graduate school has invited me to come back and speak," and her reaction was, "Why?" <laughs> and I said, "I said, Judy, it's because I, I think it's because I've had kind of an interesting career, and and you know I've done some some things that are that are neat, and and you know I might be able to impart some wisdom," and she she kind of silently walked away. <laughs> and, and a few minutes later, you know, I got this email from her, and, it, and all it said was, have you considered this? <laughs> that my career might actually be a warning to, to all the students about what maybe not to do. So, so I'm a little nervous coming in here about which, you know, which it's going to be when we get to the end. 
Um, but anyway, thank you very much for, for having me. Uh, I'm going to spend a few minutes. I, I've thought a lot about what I want to talk about. I'm going to spend a few minutes, and I, as I told the students in our meeting before and as they learned, I tend to ramble on a lot. So uh, I'm going to try and spend just a little bit of time walking you through what my career path has, has been, mostly because it's interesting to me, not that it'll be interesting to you. Um, and then I want to spend some time talking about things that I wish that I knew when I was in your spot. So you got first years here who are, you're coming to the end of mini one, still just trying to figure out what the hell happened, <laughs> you know, and second years that are uh, getting deep into recruiting now and what the hell is going to happen, you know. So what are the things that, that uh, not that people didn't tell me, but what are the things that I wish that I would have listened to a little more and things that I would have focused on a little bit more while I was here uh, and things that I think have been important to me in my career and, as, and in my growth as, as an individual, both in business and outside. Uh, and then I'm going to share a couple of my, you know, what I think are my philosophies around life and, uh, and then we'll leave plenty of time for, for questions. And I want some softballs. All right. Okay. So in, in order to kind of paint the context here, I, I feel like I have to go uh, a little bit all the way back to the beginning. Um, I graduated, as Anna said, uh, from Northern, prestigious Northern Illinois University, go Huskies, um, in DeKalb, Illinois, with a degree in finance. Or if you're more upscale, you say finance, but it was finance uh, back then. <laughs> and. And I took a job as, as an auditor for a bank. Um, and, and actually, it was, it was a great job. And I had this, you know, this vision of where my, my career was, was going to go. But almost immediately, I was kind of presented with um, one, of those, one of those big life dilemmas about what my future was going to be like. Because I had an opportunity to pursue uh, a dream that I had had since I was, you know, maybe an early teenager, right? And so I I'm trying to contemplate, you know, my, my career and what I projected my career was going to be versus, you know, an opportunity to maybe do something that, that very few people get the opportunity to do. And the advice I got at the time I thought was, was really good. You know, I was 21 years old, wasn't married, didn't have kids. Dave, tomorrow you're going to wake up and you're going to be 50, and you never want to wonder what would have happened if I would have, if I would have taken a chance. So at the ripe old age of 21, I quit my job and went on the road to become a heavy metal rock star. Uh, and I spent, <laughs> that's actually me in 1994, a year before I came to Tepper. Um, and, and it was really an interesting experience. And so, you know, I could talk for hours about what it's like to be, you know, on the road and touring the world and recording records and, and doing all that kind of stuff. But the, the, what's relevant to today was that while I was doing that, I actually, I actually had the opportunity to start a business, right, and to run a business and to, to have employees for the first time and have responsibility and, you know, the, in this business, you're working with, you know, major executives and promoters. You're working with uh, unions at, at local um, venues. And it's just a, a great slice of life. And, and honestly, I felt was preparing me for, you know, a longer term and, and larger role in that industry. But as happens a lot of times in life, there are events that, that occur that, that can change the trajectory of where you think you're going to where you ultimately wind up. And for me, that was the arrival of this cute little thing. Um, this is my daughter, who actually three weeks ago became a mom herself uh, with the birth of my first grandchild. But you know, having a family and living the the life that I was living, you know, the, they were kind of not conducive uh, together. Right, and so there's a great song out around this time uh, by George Thorogood called "Get a Haircut and Get a Real Job," right? And so that you know, I, I kind of faced that next decision. You know, what is it? You know, what what do I value? 
what's most important to me, um, and, and where ultimately do I want to make my investments of, of time. And so I decided to, uh, to kind of quit the band, sell my company, and I came to Tepper. Now, we, I wasn't this old. This was taken at the reunion, but there, you know, there, we didn't have smartphones back then. So there, there really, and I spent all my time here, so there weren't any pictures of me. <laughs> right? So, but uh, these are some of my, my classmates. And, uh, and I came to Tepper, and, and yesterday, actually, I, I had the chance to spend some time with Fala, and he, he, he was asking me, you know, why, you know, why did I decide to come to Tepper? And I don't know why I decided to come. <laughs> no, you know, I, I came here because at the time the, the school was, was really considered to be the tops in operations, and that's really what I wanted to do. And, and honestly, you know, I'm a, I run a lot on feel. Um, and when I, when I came here, it felt right. The people that I met, the people I engaged with, the atmosphere was right for me. And it's a decision that I've, that I've never regretted. It also was the decision that gave me the opportunity ultimately to work at Harley-Davidson. Because Harley-Davidson came here and recruited. I, I did a summer internship um, at Harley. And actually, before I left that summer internship, I had a full-time offer. So I was able to come back in my second year and focus on what it is that I wanted to do, but also be very selective about where I wanted to potentially work and recruit to. Ultimately, I decided to, uh, to join Harley-Davidson, and I took a role as a project manager in IT. Now, so this was 1997, and it was at that time, uh, we were kind of, as, as a country and really in business, midway through what I, what I term as the supply chain revolution. It was when, when the whole world was waking up to the power of supply chain and managing the supply chain for productivity and for, uh, for value in, in the business. And I was fortunate that someone who I still believe is one of the top minds in supply chain, a gentleman by the name of Gary Berryman, was the vice president of materials at, at Harley. And for whatever reason, he took a liking to me and actually really invested in me as, a, as an individual and, and as a mentor and recruited me to come and work in his organization. And so I spent really a bulk of my career um, in the supply chain and, and purchasing end of, of the business at Harley-Davidson. And Anna mentioned that I'd been in distribution logistics in manufacturing. Um, I, I ran materials operations for our largest plant, which is in York, Pennsylvania, which is on the east coast of, uh, of Pennsylvania here uh, for a couple of years. Um, very traditional uh, union um, you know, labor management uh, environment. Just tremendous experience. I, I still think today that if you ever have the opportunity, if you are in manufacturing in any capacity, if you have the opportunity to work on the shop floor, it's the best experience that you will, that you will ever have. Uh, so I highly encourage that. Um, so I spent time doing that, um, wanted to get into product development, wanted to broaden myself, um, and so took a role uh, coming out of manufacturing and product development, wanted to get closer to the product and, uh, and see how it was developed. And, uh, and I, was having, uh, I was having a great time at Harley, but I was, I was at a point, this is probably about eight years uh, into my career, and honestly, um, I started to get restless. And, um, and I started to feel that maybe I wasn't making the kind of forward progress or you know, upward progress that, that maybe I wanted to or I thought I should be making. And so it made it you know, really easy for me to start listening to the recruiting calls as they started to come in. Because as I said, you know, supply chain was hot. I was in one of the top supply chain organizations in the world, and you know the calls were coming. And so, um, in 1995, uh, I'm sorry, in 2005, um, I took one of those calls, and I Anna mentioned I left Harley Davidson and went to Sara Lee Corporation in Chicago. Standing here today, I would tell you is one of the biggest mistakes that I made in my career. Um, not because you know I went from being a manager 
at a four and a half billion dollar company to being a vice president at a $11 billion company. But the reality is it was a mistake because I didn't do it for the right reasons. I thought, I thought that I loved the, 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 the work of supply chain management, but the reality was I was chasing money and title. And, and what I learned was that my love of supply chain and, and a salary and a big title wasn't enough to be fulfilling to me, right? I, I went from, I like to say I went from bikes to bread and bacon. <laughs> and, um, and what I realized was that it's not just about the work that I was doing, but I had to have, I had to have an affinity, I had to have a, a connection to what the company was doing and to, what, and to the products that we were providing and to the experience that we were giving to our customers. And so I was very fortunate that one day I was sitting in my office at Sara Lee and the phone rang and it was a friend of mine, former boss at Harley Davidson, who, uh, who eventually went on to become our CEO, calling me and asking me if I would be interested in coming back. And, you know, hiding my glee and not saying, hell yeah, you know, I, was, I said, well, that would be interesting. I'd love to talk to you about that opportunity. <laughs> So, you know, the long and short of it is that, that, uh, that I, I wound up going back to Harley, and they recruited me to come back and, and do some work in indirect procurement, which was about applying um, supply chain strategy and supply chain tactics around how you manage direct material into factories to things like marketing spend and IT spend um, and product development and other things. And it was a really, really excellent opportunity. Um, Anna mentioned then that uh, I led the development of our street platform. Um, in 2009, I, yeah, I believe it was 2009, um, the, the market in India was opening up uh, to motorcycling, to heavyweight motorcycling. Um, prior to that, uh, there was a cap on the, the engine displacement for motorcycles that could be sold in that, in that market. Harley-Davidson, working with the uh, U.S. government and the Indian government, got that restriction lifted, which opened up you know, that, that market to us. And I was selected as one of the people to be part of the team to take Harley-Davidson into India. Specifically, my role was to lead, uh, for the first time outside of the formal product development organization, the development of a new motorcycle platform that would be specifically designed for the Indian market. Um, and it was, a, it was a tremendous experience because I had no product development experience. I'm not an engineer, you know, but it was not, I was put in the role because of my leadership capability, not because of my technical capability. So it was a fascinating learning experience for me. Uh, I, I mentioned in the meeting before, I've probably been to India about 20 times. Um, fantastic uh, country. If you haven't been there, you got to go. Um, but a really great learning experience for me um, and was very happy uh, in that role. And ultimately, we were, we were very successful in bringing a product out that caught on not only in India, but is now sold globally, including here in the U.S. Um, so really great experience. But in uh, kind of mid-2011, the role of CIO um, opened up. And again, if you, if you look, I, I don't have a lot of IT experience except for you know, a little box down there at the bottom. But I knew, based on everywhere else that I had been in the company, that, that we would not be successful given what was happening with emerging technology and what we've now seen as, as this tremendous explosion and disruption caused by technology, that we as a company would not be successful unless we had a world-class IT organization. And so I, I said, I really, want, I really want that job. And I called our president, I said, I want that job. And he said, no way. <laughs> and, uh, you know, but the, the lesson here is, you know, when I went in to talk to, to the gentleman who would eventually become my boss, he said, hey, you know, Dave, you're a great guy. You've had a great career here. You're doing great in sales. I think you should stay there. What, what we really need is someone who's deep in SAP, and we need someone with all this deep technical background. And I looked at him, and I said, you know what, John, if, that, if, if that's what you think you need, then you're right. I'm not the guy. But I don't think that's what you need. 
What you need is, is someone who can come in and set some vision for where this organization needs to go. And I painted a picture of, of everything that I had done in my, in my background and why I thought it was relevant beyond the technical expertise to get the company where, where we needed to go. Right? And, that, and that the reality was that if you want your, your senior executive in IT running projects, then, then it's probably not a job I'm interested in. But if you want someone that can set a vision, who can fight for the resources, who can break down barriers and help get those people where they want to go in their career, then I'm the guy. And it took him a few months, but he came around, right? And so, uh, so today, since uh, late 2011, I've been the CIO for Harley-Davidson. It is absolutely the greatest job that I've ever had in my life. Um, you know, IT, for those of you that maybe aren't considering a career in IT, let me just say this, that, that um, again, another mistake I think I made, I wish I would have stayed in IT a little bit longer. It is the only function in the company that, that touches every employee. In our case, every employee, every dealer, every customer, and every potential customer every single day. It's the only one. And so it's, it's a great place to get... Um, a breadth of experience and a breadth of exposure to the business in a way that, that you're just not going to get in any other function. So that's my pitch for IT. I think you should, I think you should all consider that. Um, so this has been my, my career, and, and there's a couple of things that I think are, are interesting. The first one that I think you'll notice is it's not very linear, right? So, um, and I think that this is an important thing to think about. Very few people will wind up at the end of their career where they thought they, they would when they started. I never would have dreamed that I would be standing here today um, as an IT leader, given that I came out of school with a degree in finance, right? Um, the second thing is that uh, it's, it's also not all upward, right? I think the important thing for me in my career has been the breadth of experience and a willingness to pursue opportunities where they are and not, except for the one mistake that I highlighted before, not just always thinking about what the next level up is, but really focusing on where is my passion, what, what is it that, that I want to learn, where can I contribute, uh, and, and what's going to round me out ultimately to prepare me for, for something you know, bigger and better in the future. So. Um, with that, I want to just talk about a few things that, again, I said I wish maybe I knew or I wish I would have internalized more. As I was reminded yesterday, you know, Dave, we told you all these things when you came here, you know. Um, but, you know, my point is that your professors are telling you this stuff. You should be listening to this stuff and you should really be internalizing it. You know, speaking 20 years out. Um, I think it's really important. And the first thing is, you know, don't be in a hurry, right? Don't, don't make that, that mistake. Don't, don't measure yourself against um, what you perceive, you know, the rate of change or the rate of progress in your, your career should be. And recognize that the fact that, that you're sitting here today at one of the top business schools, not only in the country, but really in the world, puts you ahead of 99% of the rest of the world already, right? So you don't, have to be, you don't have to be impatient. And then secondly, follow your passion. Don't sell out, right? Always be looking at opportunities that add something to you and something that you can be excited about. You've got to get up and go to work every day. You need to go, you need to go and be somewhere where, where you can be engaged. And I'm going to touch more on that uh, in a second. The second thing is um, know yourself. And when I say know yourself, I, I mean no BS, know yourself. Um, we talked a little bit about this in, in the meeting before, and the, the conversation was about, it, it drifted into kind of managing across generations and talking about boomers versus Xers versus millennials and this um, this kind of trend that I see amongst the younger people on my staff that really have this, this yearning for authenticity, not, not just in products and experiences, but in the people that they, that they work with, and most of all, in the leaders that, that they choose to follow, right? And you can't, 
really be an authentic leader unless you really know yourself and, and, and why, why you behave the way you do, what makes you tick. One of the conversations that, that I think led to me being here was this conversation that I had with Dr. Weingard around, man, I wish I would have paid more attention in that first OB class. Right? And, I was, and I'm glad that, that I took um, Dr. Argoti's second class, because uh, otherwise I really would have been lost. But this is probably the number, the number one thing. You know, be authentic. And one of the reasons is because the higher you go, the less truth you hear. Right? The less truth you hear from the people that work for you, because they don't want to tell you when they think you're wrong, and the less you hear from the people that are above you, because you're the competition. And so if you don't have a good perspective on yourself, and the second most valuable thing is to have someone that you work with that's willing to tell you the truth about yourself, um, incredibly valuable and something that everybody needs to, be, needs to be seeking because everyone can spot a fake. You guys, you guys know it. You, you know it when you're, in, when you're in class, not here, but maybe at some other, some other place you've been and the teacher is just mailing it in. You know, or they, you know, they don't really care. You know, you've had a boss that's, that's really maybe political or in it for themselves. Everybody can spot a fake, right? But if you truly want to drive change and you truly want to drive transformation in a business, you got to be able to engage your people. And the only way you can do that is if you are the most authentic leader that you can, that you can be. The next thing is be 100% in or get 100% out. And this is... You know, we talk about this from a leadership standpoint um, as it relates to being able to, to drive engagement. I want to take it to a deeper level because I, I believe that when, as soon as you become a manager, you have, you have a moral obligation to be engaged and to be bought in to where your organization is going because the people that work for you, they deserve, they deserve to have a leader that's bought in because if you're not, then you rob them of the opportunity to be fully engaged and be bought into where they're going and to be fulfilled in their career. And one of the things that I often say when I take over a new group is, because often it's, I'm kind of like the plumber, right? I'm coming in to clean up somebody else's mess and, and to try and take us to a new place. And I say, you know, we're going, we're going someplace different and I need you as my team to be 100% in. And if you are, that's great. If you're not, that's okay too. But you can't work for me. And don't lie because your actions will find you out, right? Because getting back to everybody can spot a fake. You need to be, you need to be 100% in. And you need to be willing to work harder than anybody else. Never, never ask your team to do something that you're not willing to do yourself. Um, you know, trust me, I'm not, the, not necessarily the sharpest guy ever, but you know what, I'm willing to do whatever it takes to make the organization successful. And I will take on my team, I will take people with passion and drive over you know, maybe who's the smartest guy in, in the room or the smartest lady in the room, but doesn't have the drive to get there. And I think that, quite honestly, this is one of the things that, that you learn at this program, right? Because you can't survive this program unless you're really willing to dig in and work. Uh, so. Always remember that. Um, next, build your network. Um, and when I say build your network, I'm not talking about it in, in kind of the political fashion. I mean, it's, it's about making sure that you always have access to uh, information and people that can help you along, along the way. Um, because you know, we talk a lot about technology these days, but the reality is that the world still runs on relationships. Okay, and being able to build those and build those in an authentic, constructive way uh, will be absolutely critical to your success, more today than, than ever before, particularly with a generation that, like I said, is, is seeking authenticity rather than willing to accept direction just because there's a hierarchy. Um, next, don't be intimidated. Um, and again, I credit Tepper, GSIA Tepper, with really driving this home for me. I, after coming here, I realized that there is no problem that can't be broken down, modeled, and solved. 
right? And the, and the reality is it's true. It is absolutely true. And, and I could tell you story after story about, you know, seeing people flame out because the elephant is, the elephant is this big and, and we, we can't, we just can't consume it, right? But if you, if you have that confidence and that understanding that, you know what, we can, st- we can step back and there's some way, I, maybe it's not visible, but there's always some way that we can break this down into chunks that we can, that we can model, that we can understand, and that we can solve. And, and as we solve each piece, ultimately the whole resolution becomes visible. Right? And this is a critical skill that, and Fala asked me this yesterday, you know, do I not see this with, so I work with people from, from Harvard and Northwestern and Wharton and Chicago and whatever, and they make great staffers, don't get me wrong. But, you know, do I, is it not something that I see? And yeah, I do, but not the same way that we learned it here in the same um, thoughtful way of remaining calm and, and breaking those things down. So it's, it's a real gem here, and I, I hope you take advantage of uh, internalizing it. And then lastly, don't sacrifice your integrity. All right, so there's a great saying that um, integrity is the, is the one gift that you give to yourself as an individual. Because in reality, no one can ever take it away. You can only give it away, right? And so whatever, and, and trust me, it, it's easy to give it away. You, you will see it over and over again. Um, but making sure that you are true to yourself, true to your values, that when you fail, that you own it, that you're accountable for it, that you learn from it, and that you move on from it. Um, you know, it's, it's absolutely a distinguishing facet of, of, your, of who you are as an individual that will set you apart from, from the crowd. So big encouragement there. Uh, lastly, I just want to share a couple of, there was a really great question about, you know, things that I have learned or philosophies that I have, and I happen to have prepared some, and so I want to share them with you. The first one is, is about luck, and people, you know, often say, boy, look at, look at you, look at how, how lucky you are. I want to remind everybody that luck is something that occurs at the intersection of preparation and opportunity, right? So... So my career hasn't been uh, a series of lucky coincidences. It's been based on the fact that I've, that I've prepared myself for each and every opportunity. Another kind of thing that I didn't touch on but I believe is that when I get a role, my, my primary motivation personally is to figure out how to make myself irrelevant in the running of that, of that organization. So how do I build a strong enough team that they can run the business. Because if it takes two people, if it takes me and one of my direct reports to make the decisions about how their organization runs, one of us is redundant, right? So I want a team that is fully capable of running the, the, the business function in my absence so that I can be focused on sticking my nose in everybody else's business to figure out you know, where I can help and what, what, what else can I be doing to help advance the organization. Right, so always be preparing. Always be thinking about what, what is it that I might want to do next so that when that opportunity comes, and even when the boss thinks that they want something different, you're able to paint a compelling vision of why, why your vision is the right one. Right? Second, on failure. What I didn't spend a lot of time on here was that I have, I have a career that is also marked by epic failure. Right? I, have, I am the personal holder of the, in manufacturing, how many people have been in manufacturing? Right, so what's the most important thing in manufacturing when you're in a capacity constrained company? It's units off the assembly line, right? And at Harley Davidson, every 86 seconds, $5,500 in gross margin rolls off the end of the assembly line. So downtime on the assembly line is a big no-no. And you're looking at the world record holder for downtime on the assembly line at Harley Davidson. You know, the, the, the reality is you, you, you are going to fail. But I got this great piece of advice one time when I was fretting over a failure that I had had. And, and it was from my father. And he, he listened to me whine about, 
you know, how, how horrible I was. And he said, you know what, Dave? Someone who hits three out of 10 in baseball is probably going to the Hall of Fame, right? There's only been one person in the history of Major League Baseball that hit four out of 10 for a season. Why do you think you got to hit 10 out of 10? Because the reality is you won't. You are going to fail. And we talk about um, learning from failure, and that is, that is important. But equally important to learning from failure is owning it, right? And being accountable for it and driving what you're going to do differently the next time so that you don't repeat. Um, my philosophy on other people is really simple. Nobody gets up in the morning and thinks, how can I do a bad job today? It seems like they do. <laughs> but I, but I, have to, I, have to, I have to get in my mind that that's not what they're thinking when they get out of bed. And so as a leader, grace becomes a very important part of, of who you are, in my opinion. And your ability to, to meet people where they are, even when they're not doing a good job, and to be able to extend grace in, in failure and to help people learn and to help people grow. I, I really blew through at the beginning, but you know I view my role as having four components. You know, One, being able to set the vision for the organization. Two, getting the resources or fighting for the resources that my group needs to execute that vision. Three, being able to remove any barriers that they're going to encounter in order to help meet that vision. But those are all focused on the business and on business outcomes. The fourth one is it's my responsibility to help get those people where they want to go in their career. Right? And so really investing in developing those people and recognizing that, you know what, it might be a lack of understanding. It might be that they had bad leadership before. It might be that they're in the wrong position. Right? But they're not trying to do a bad job. And so how am I as a leader helping them to be successful? Because ultimately, my ability to be successful is dependent on the people that work for me, on my team. On purpose in life, you know, every morning, I try and get up, and I'm going to give you the book where this came from in a minute, but every, every morning when I get up, I, I ask myself this question, what am I going to do today to make someone else's life better, right? Because that's ultimately what it's, what it's about, at least what it's about for me, is, you know, how am I making a contribution? How am I being engaged? And, and how am I helping someone else get to be where they want to go? That's, that's one of the reasons why Harley-Davidson has been such a great company for me. Our company purpose is we fulfill dreams of personal freedom for our customers around the world. Right? Somewhere somebody is dreaming about getting out in the wind on a, on a Harley-Davidson, and they, and they might be in Vietnam, or they might be in India, or they might be in Tennessee. Right? And what am I doing today as the CIO, and what am I helping my team to do today to help that person ultimately achieve their dream? Because nobody needs a Harley Davidson. Nobody, right? I mean, nobody needs one to survive. They buy them because they want them, and because it's an extension of who they are, or it makes a statement about who they are. So how am I helping to contribute to that every day? And then lastly, just my general philosophy on life is enjoy the ride. Right? So the, the inevitable fact is that, you know, at least here on this, this planet, you know, one day our existence will come to an end. And today, where you are, it seems like a long way off. For me, maybe not so much. For these guys, it's even closer. But just going back to what I, what I said before, just going back to what I said before, you know, you guys are, you are ahead of most of the rest of the world. You are going to have opportunities that you, that you can't imagine, right? Make sure that, that, you are, that you are picking something and that you are pursuing something that you are going to enjoy doing every day, right? Because it's, you know, life, life is short, and you got to enjoy it while you're here. So, um, just briefly, there, you know, um, someone had asked me before about some books 
There are some things that I recommend. These are three books that I recommend that uh, every leader read. The, two, the first two are by Patrick Lencioni. They're very light reads, but they're very powerful. Um, three Signs of a Miserable Job and the Five Dysfunctions of a Team. And then around that whole topic of authenticity, um, I really like this book by Carissa Thacker. It's, um, it's a little more academic, um, but it really digs into the science around authenticity, and I think it's been a, a very powerful read for me in my career. So with that, I want to thank you for having me here today. I hope you enjoyed it. I'll be glad to take any questions that, uh, that you have. Yes. My name is Brian, I'm a second year. Um, so you talked about how you got into the role of people, your leadership position, not necessarily your skill set, your technical skill set. Um, and I've, I've also heard sort of contrary to that, is when you're younger in your career, it's easier to move around and take on different roles, and as you sort of go up, you get a little bit more pigeonholed. So how have you been able to resist that sort of pigeonholing effect as you continue to move up in your career? Yeah, that's a that's a that's a great question because I think that 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 is um, that can be true. Fortunately for me, um, that's not that's not the culture at, at Harley Davidson. Um, the the culture and the kind of the thing that they say when when you start the company is you're you're really only limited by what it is you want to do and and what you want to pursue. Um, so so culturally, you will see. Um, you will see people move even at senior leadership levels across across functions. Um, now there are some where that becomes more difficult, where they're you know you're not going to see me go in and be the chief engineer on a on a motorcycle platform just because I don't have that that technical that technical depth, and in some places it's required. But um, you know the the brief answer to your question is again just always having my eyes up and, and looking at what it is that I might want to do. Ultimately, yes, the, the higher you go, there, is, there are just fewer positions. There are fewer VP positions than there are manager positions. So it gets back to the don't be in a hurry, right? And making sure that I know uh, what experiences that I wanted to try and where I wanted to be before I ultimately decided what I want to do when I grow up. Make sense? Yes, ma'am. Um, what are some current like, issues that you like, foresee for Harley in terms of like, internet of things and e-commerce online? Um, I mean, it's something that you started, I guess, in 2011. So yeah. what do you think is happening now that are challenges for you and the company face? Yeah, this is, a really, this is a really great question because and we talked about it earlier in the previous session. So the Harley-Davidson... Uh, I would bet that if I asked you guys, if Anna hadn't given that introduction and I asked how big our company was, um, that, that, we would get, that we would get a lot higher numbers or a lot higher guesses than reality. The fact is that we are under a $6 billion company. We have just over, just under 6,000 em employees, um, but we have this huge brand. And we have one of, depending on what... Um, survey you read one of the mo one of the top four or five recognizable brands in in the world so the challenge though to get to your question is that that brand um, means very specific things to our customers and and there is there's 115 well 114 next year will be 115 year legacy of what that means and what authentic harley davidson really means and so the challenge that we face, and you, and you hit on it, and we talked about it a lot earlier, is how, how do we apply technology um, in our business to our product in a way that doesn't disturb that brand promise or that experience that people want to have? I mean, there are millions of people walking around with the bar and shield tattooed on their body. And so we don't want them getting ticked off, right? you know, and uh, coming to hurt us. 
but so there is this balance, and it's something that, that we struggle with every day. And, and it does mean, by definition, that sometimes we will appear to be slower to, uh, to adopt. Um, we don't have a huge e-commerce presence. In fact, we don't, we don't really have an e-commerce presence outside of the, of the U.S., right? And, and we're growing that. Now, operationally is a different story. Operationally, it's a different balance. It's a balance between uh, investment and getting value for investment out of technology and then the pace at which we can apply it to operations. But we are, you know, when it comes to Internet of Things in our plants um, and things like that, you know, we, we, are, we are actively looking at how we adopt that. But when it comes to the product and the impact of that on the brand, whether it's technology, fractional ownership, autonomous vehicles, whatever it is, we got to step very carefully because we can't disturb what that means to the customer. Does that make sense? Yes. You talked a lot about authenticity. What are some things that you think you can do both as a person and as a brand to kind of signal that authenticity? Yeah, um, so starting as a, as a, as a person, um, I said before, it's, it's, it's knowing yourself. You know, I, I spend a lot of, I'm, I love to read kind of self-improvement books. I love to read um, and understand what, it, what is leadership and what, what is, um, you know, trying to understand, you know, my personality. What drives me? Why do I make the decisions that I make? Why do I react? Why do I react to situations the way I do? And recognizing that, um, that I am that I am the master of that, right? That 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 what someone else thinks or what someone else does does not determine how I feel or how I think or how I act. I do, whether it's consciously or or unconsciously. And the and the trick for me, and I think the trick for every leader, is to be more conscious about it. And, and to, you know, uh, oftentimes there's just a millisecond between some external stimulus and how you're going to react. But is that a conscious millisecond where you're deciding um, this business problem is being presented to me, this performance issue is being presented to me, this executive is yelling at me, this person is doing, you know, whatever it is, I'm the one that controls how I react. And, and that, that, that those reactions are always in alignment with what my core values are, what the standards are that I've set for myself, whether it's with my family, with, you know, with my wife, with my children, with my friends, whatever, that I'm, that I'm acting consistent with that. And if I'm doing that, authenticity is, is evident. You know? And am I able to stand up in front of um, a room this this size or larger of, of the people that that work for me and say you know what I made a mistake and I screwed up and as a result this is you guys were all impacted but this is what I'm going to do to try and fix it you know people see through the the spinning and the and the whatever and, and like I said you guys all of you have worked before you've seen it right why, and, and you know that you don't want to follow someone like that. So why be somebody like that? From a company standpoint, it's, 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 it's the same, but it's on an organizational level. It's do we really understand what, what, what is foundational to the brand? And, and we talk about um, us as employees of the company and leaders in the company we don't own that brand. That brand is owned by the customer. They've, they've defined it. They've defined what's important to it and what, what's core to them. So are we acting in ways and are we making decisions in ways that are, that are true to that, um, that preserve that, that steward that, that shepherds that to the future for the next hundred years of, of Harley-Davidson? Make sense? Okay. Thank God. <laughs> so thank you very much to Dave for our great Thank you. Was that okay?